Sermon 174, True Love Chapel, taking a look at Matthew chapter 20. This is the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Um, now this, uh, this Matthew chapter 20, this parable, is a continuation of a conversation here, a, con a continuation of the rich young man uh, story, where the rich mo young man asked, Teacher, what good me deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And on and on, and he, he tells him, keep the commandments. And then he tells him, uh, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And then the disciples heard this, and uh, they were amazed by it. And they're, they're asking him about it. And Jesus says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of, an e of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So, um, um, then Jesus, uh, obviously Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter goes on and say, in verse 27 of Matthew 19, Peter says, in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? So Peter is asking, you know, certainly they gave up a lot to follow Jesus, um, those original disciples. And um, they did. You know, he told their rich young man uh, to give up his possessions, and he went away sorrowful because he was clinging to those things. But the disciples, they gave up what they had and they they did follow jesus and so peter's asking what then will we have and so here we go with the answer he answers it and then he continues with the parable of the laborers in the vineyard to to explain it but he's, the answer is in verse 28 jesus said to them truly i say to you in the new world when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And I believe he is talking about the 12 disciples there, that they were the ones asking the question. He's answering them directly. They will have, they will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. Wow. Interesting. And, um, Okay, so there you have that. And then it says uh, in verse 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. And many who are first will be last and the last first. So you're going to receive a hundredfold. Um, in another uh, different book of the gospel it says, uh, receive a hundredfold in this life, I think it says, and then in the and then eternal life. So, <clears throat> yeah, you're definitely going to be you're going to be getting something out of it. And um, and then he goes on with this parable finally. So this is a continuation. And the, the end of the parable, the end of uh, the parable in verse sixteen on chapter twenty. Is the same as the end of uh, chapter 19, verse 30. It says, so the last will be first and the first last. So this is what he's illustrating. Okay. Goes on with the parable. And I think we're familiar with this parable. We need to uh, read it. If you're a Christian and uh, you don't know this parable, well, you got to read your Bible. There's no excuse for that. So um, get on a reading plan. You know, sign up for one. We got one at truelovechapel.com, and that'll take you through the entire Bible every year. And we're especially focused in the New Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, last couple of years, we've been just taking it slow, but um, not necessarily reading the entire thing. But definitely, we're reading through the New Testament every year, day by day, week by week. And it's very fruitful. So this this uh, this is a story about a master uh, of a vineyard who uh, verse twenty uh, verse 
verse 1 of chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going about out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And it goes on and on. In verse 6, he says, um, Why do you stand here idle all day? Verse 7, they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And, and it continues this way all throughout the day. Um, that was a normal way of hiring uh, a day laborer. They would be out there. Um, and, uh, you know, waiting for someone to hire him. So the first one he hired right in the, the morning, right probably around 6 in the morning, to work for a denarius, which is normal daily wage. And then um, and then as, he, as the day goes on, he hires more. And he doesn't tell the other ones what he's going to pay them. He just says he's going to pay them what's right. Okay. And it goes on until he finally pays them and... Uh, and we know the story. What happens is he pays the one who worked only one hour, and he pays him a denarius. And then he goes down the line, and the ones who were there all day assumed that they would be getting more than a denarius since they were there all day, but he pays them the same. They complain about it, and then he says, um, verse 13, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or you do, be, do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. So there you go. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what this story means. Um, but first I want to just say like, this story, I mean, a lot of times, like, in, in work, in my work, or in anyone's work, but in my work, um, sometimes you see that you feel like you're the one that's doing all the work, right? And the people around you aren't really contributing as much. But because of stories like this in the Bible, and God's wisdom of putting it there, um, I think one of the things it can teach us is that, you know, we're supposed to work hard as if we're working for the Lord. We're supposed to work hard. The uh, the boss of your company, whoever you're working for, they hired you to do a job, and they hired you to do the best job that you could do. Uh, not to worry about the guy next to you is slacking, or the guy next to you is not doing as much as you are. So just remember that, that you need to do the best job that you can for what you agreed and not worry about the other people, not worry if it's going to be fair all the time, because life isn't fair all the time, okay? And uh, and that's a great attitude for Christians to have, not to be jealous. Now, sometimes the other people will get more money or they'll get more recognition or promotion for doing less work, and we're not supposed to be uh, begrudging the generosity of the boss. We certainly agreed for our salary that we're working for, and then we should be content with that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And the Christians should not have any ounce of jealousy in them towards others. Um, so just remember that. And um, oftentimes, though, um, having the attitude of being someone who is just fair, I mean, uh, content with what's being agreed with and just... Uh, not not worrying about what's fair actually uh you're just worried you're not even worried about anything you're just uh, um following your end of the bargain um which you agreed uh with your boss okay and so you just quietly go about your job the boss probably didn't hire you to be a manager at least not in the first place um if you're working your way up through a company or something so leave it to the management to let them figure out who's doing a good job or not. And in fact, if you really want to go the extra mile, 
you should be the one who is helping the people around you, lifting them up, covering for them, encouraging them, helping them. They might not be as great of a worker as you are, but if you can lift up the, the man next to you, then you're really doing um, a proper service in your work. Um, so yeah, you don't worry about um, whether it's fair or not. You just work as if you're working for the Lord. But now what this story is really about is a, it's about the grace of God. And um, God dishes out His grace not according to what we deserve. That's, that's what this story is really about. Because... We don't, I mean, grace by its very definition, grace means unmerited favor. And um, so God is giving us this unmerited favor, this favor that we did not earn, that goes above and beyond what we deserve. And in fact, this story is not the perfect illustration. Um, well, it's perfect for what it is and for what it does, but you have to realize the limitations of this parable. So in this parable, they're actually working, and they did deserve a denarius. But in the, in the real kingdom of God, we don't work for our salvation at all. You know, you might say that their, uh, their working was uh, similar to us being um, just accepting salvation in, in Jesus Christ, accepting the gift. That's our denarius. That's the starting point. Um, and on that foundation we build. Um, and some will be rewarded more. Um, from that, it's like, um, it doesn't depend on, on what we deserve. It depends on, on what? It depends on God, what he sees fit. So we have to trust that God knows uh, what he's doing. He's going he's gonna to give grace. He's going to give more grace to who he, he chooses, not based on what they deserve. And um, we just have to trust that he's doing the right thing. Just as it says in here that um, it says, whatever is right, I will give to you. So that's right. God does give us whatever is right. He is just. He's also merciful and full of grace. And so it's about the character of God. And uh, we see the human character there in as much as uh, the natural tendency of the people is to be greedy and it is to be jealous. You know, they wanted more. They wanted what the, the other guy had. They assumed that they would get more, more than the other person. Um, and that's not an attitude that was pleasing to the master, right? That God has every, every right to dish out blessings and uh, honor and uh, you know grace to whoever he pleases and uh, and that's up to him in his own perfect wisdom he will do what is right and so he's doing what is right and we're the ones who are wrong if we're going to be jealous about that um, if your friend is forgiven more you know you could say that um, is one sense of of looking at it people have often looked at this story some say it, it could mean like um, the way we're all forgiven for our sins in Jesus Christ you know Christ died on the cross to uh, to pay the price for our sins so that as many um, as many as who, who believe him he, God has given the the right and the power to become sons of God and um, and that means that the righteousness of God is imparted to us uh, because of the gift of God, not because of, of what we have done to deserve it. So it's God's grace received through faith. So what about what about someone who has sinned a lot, you know, in their life, and then towards the end of their life, they turn, they repent, and they accept Jesus Christ, and they're forgiven for all of that that they've done. Or what about the, the person who's lived their whole life struggling as a Christian 
and has, um, you know, done their best to, to follow every rule and every law. And um, maybe they feel like they haven't sinned as much as the other guy. And, uh, and they're forgiven for their sins just the same. So in our, in our minds, it's like it doesn't seem fair, <laughs> but we have to trust, um, trust God. And don't, be, don't feel jealous or something if someone else is forgiven more. We should be happy that, that they were forgiven. And uh, certainly, you know, we all have the same way of getting saved, which is through uh, putting our faith in Jesus Christ. That that's the way that we receive God's grace, God's gift of salvation. But on that foundation, we build. And uh, as we build, that's when, um, as we do, we're doing the work of God, as the Holy Spirit is working through us, in us and through us. Um, and we become vessels useful to God sanctified and set apart for him then God is doing this stuff and through our lives he's bearing fruit for the kingdom of God in our lives at the same time we are going to be storing up treasures in heaven so we'll be we will be rewarded extra for things that are done in faith things that are done in Christ but um but the starting point is the same. It's, it's faith in Jesus Christ. That's what gets you eternal life. And now, now God can reward you above and beyond that. You know, not just eternal life, but also just gives you uh, treasures in heaven to enjoy for eternity. So he can reward you more. That's certainly, that's certainly okay. And then... Um, one other thing I wanted to point out before we wrap this up is that in uh, verse 6, it says, About the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? Verse 7, They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. So he seems kind of uh, surprised. All throughout the day, morning, uh, noon, afternoon, evening, he still sees these people idle, standing around, waiting for someone to hire them. Meanwhile, the master of the house, he has, it seems like a, a, an unlimited supply of work to be done. He's hiring, he's hiring these guys left and right, and he still keeps finding them lay, sitting around doing not much of anything, waiting for someone to call them out. Um, <clears throat> so just remember that God has, God has a work to be done. Uh, he said the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So that comes back to us. You know, God is, God is busy working. He's not stopped working he's doing his work in the world with or without you he'll find someone willing to do it but it comes back to us are we going to be willing and and able to work um are we just going to stand around idle all day waiting for this for something yeah there's a lot of work to be done to be done there's a lot of people that misunderstand what christianity is all about uh, i try to make it a point to talk to people um, regularly I, w I don't know about every day probably but certainly every week i'll have um, you know probably one or two or three very interesting conversations with somebody whether at work or um, maybe somebody, uh, maybe somebody online too. Sometimes I'll, if I don't have anyone talking to that week, I'll go online and I'll find someone to talk to and, um, uh, just witness and spread the gospel, um, 
I like to just throw a little apologetic knowledge out there and just see how people react because I know that most of them have never heard that. <clears throat> and so they can hear the same things from uh, the world all day long and they're getting uh, misled. <clears throat> they're getting the wrong impression of what Christianity is, is like. When they say things like uh, they think Christianity is just a blind faith, you just believe it in spite of all evidence. Well, that's absolutely wrong. It's the opposite. All evidence is in support of Christianity. And, uh, I mean, all world views require faith. Christianity requires the least amount of faith since it's supported by the most evidence. Go read that book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Uh, it's a tremendous book. But, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm doing that. I make it a point. I make it an effort to do that. But I'm sure that I don't, I'm not doing as much as I could be. And I, I'm, we're all, I think we can all say that. So we need to uh, sort of examine ourselves, see whether we are maybe a little too idle in our lives, in our Christian walk. Maybe there's more that we could do, you know, to reach people. Mm, just to be a little more outspoken maybe. You know, be a little kinder and be a little, whoever you, you talk to, I mean, just bring up the subject, invite them to church, invite them to, over to your house. Um, things that you think you should be doing, but we're oftentimes uh, a little too idle, a little too lazy to do all that. Well, I think uh, we need to remember that the God that saved us has, has work to be done, and he's doing his work. And uh, it's our job to join him. The Great Commission, you know, make disciples of all nations. So, and, um, and of course, you know, trust in the wisdom of God. As far as the parable goes, uh, there might be some surprises. And... As far as who gets what reward when we get to heaven and all that, I don't know. I'm not sure how. I cannot imagine what what that would be like. But it does it does doesn't really work the way humans think it works, because God's wisdom is so much higher than ours. He knows. Like I say he knows what he's doing, and he knows how to be fair and just and right in his dealings, and uh, we simply need to trust trust in him. All right, let's pray. Almighty God, please bless us. Help us as Christians in our Christian walk. Help us to uh, to not be idle. Keep us busy. Keep us active. Keep us growing day by day, week by week. Bless us to have fruitful, meaningful conversations with people about Christ and let our lives point people to Jesus Christ. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to to uh, draw people into Christ and, uh, and to be saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.